Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Josh Fried. I am the Senior Vice President of Third Way's Climate and Energy Program, where our mission is to put the US on the fastest, fairest path to net zero emissions. We have hosted events with presidential candidates, clean energy experts, CEOs, and senators. And I can truly say in all earnestness that this is one of the events I have been most excited about, proud about, and, and couldn't wait to convene. When we started working on advanced nuclear energy back in 2013, many policy experts in Washington either hadn't even heard of it, or they joked that advanced reactors were always 10 years away from being 10 years away. What we saw was a set of technologies that had enormous potential to help the world reach ambitious climate goals and help the US generate economic growth in tens of thousands of jobs. Flash forward to today, we have multiple advanced reactors now on track to be built by innovative companies like TerraPower and X-Energy with the support of the federal government and private capital before the end of this decade. And as we'll discuss today, they are likely to be built with union workers like the members of the United Association and North America's building trades unions. Why do we care so much? because advanced nuclear is essentially a new industry that could help us eliminate carbon pollution from the electricity sector, from industrial processes, and create clean hydrogen while also lifting up so many segments of the workforce. And that includes workers who are too often left behind during economic disruptions and transitions, like those in rural areas and traditional energy producing regions of the country. The advanced nuclear industry and its supply chains can put highly skilled, highly paid jobs in these communities and across the country while exporting U.S. clean energy technologies around the world. To get there, however, we need Washington to finish the job begun by Congress in the Obama administration and make sure advanced reactors get over the finish line. With the growing set of bipartisan supporters behind these technologies, the odds have never looked better. Whether it's the vision spelled out by President Biden's America Jobs Plan, the infrastructure package being negotiated between Capitol Hill and the White House, or the upcoming budget and appropriation cycle, advanced nuclear is deep in the mix in today's most important policy conversations. Now, we'll be hearing from an excellent set of speakers and panelists about where the advanced nuclear industry is headed, the important role that union workers can and must play in its success, and the policies that can turn this vision into a reality. It is my privilege and pleasure first to introduce our keynote speaker for this event. Dr. Katie Huff, the Acting Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. The Biden administration has a very ambitious agenda to expand nuclear's role as a source of clean energy, good paying jobs, and American competitiveness. And Dr. Huff has the technical chops and the strategic vision to steer this effort at DOE and lead the agency's partnership with industry, labor, and other stakeholders to achieve multiple national priorities. Before joining DOE, Dr. Huff was an assistant professor in the University of Illinois Department of Nuclear, Plasma, and Radiological Engineering. She now oversees a $1.5 billion portfolio of nuclear energy research, development, demonstration, and deployment programs at DOE. And we are very honored to have her here today. Dr. Huff? Well, of course, it's my honor to be here, and I'm excited to be speaking to you about this American Jobs Plan, the potential for advanced nuclear in the Biden administration, and our hopes 
models for how all of these things together can really support high paying, skilled jobs with the free and fair opportunity to join a union. Um, I think there are a few key items to the Biden-Harris administration's direction in terms of existing and future nuclear plants. Of course, existing plants uh, prevent almost 500 million metric tons of carbon dioxide every year, and the Biden administration is extremely serious about transitioning to zero carbon. And so these existing plants are gonna pay, play an extremely important role in ensuring that that is possible. The American Jobs Plan puts into perspective various options for ensuring their market competitiveness. And I'm very excited to say that it also looks into the possibility of advanced nuclear demonstrations, as well as procurements that might contribute to the supply chain for those reactors. You know, constructing a standard nuclear plant requires over 3,000 workers. And while advanced nuclear plants may be a little smaller, maybe a little leaner and more efficient, we expect to see really similar numbers as we deploy, for example, the two demonstration reactors under the ARDP program, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. And we hope that once commercialized, those deployed reactors, which are targeting the mid 2020s, along with their risk reduction counterparts, which we expect a little later in the decade, we expect that once commercialized, the deployment of those reactors and many more second and third and nth of a kind reactors of those categories and others uh, should be able to open up tens of thousands of good paying job opportunities if we deploy hundreds and dozens of them. Um, and these good paying job opportunities should focus on American engineers, technicians, manufacturers, boiler makers, electricians, and all kinds of other energy workers. And we're really excited to be seeing some really creative endeavors from these companies. So for example, a coal to nuclear transition that's being um, thought about by Terra Power in Wyoming is representative of the kinds of creative transitions for American energy jobs that the Biden administration cares about. As we look at nuclear and advanced nuclear in particular, there are other industries that we can leverage to save jobs of good paying, high skilled union workers and bring them into our energy transition along with us. So we hope to expand those impacts, lead climate innovation and demonstrate the next generation of these commercial nuclear reactors, uh, potentially even a next generation of test research and training reactors. Generally speaking, the US government is really well positioned also to leverage some of the procurement language in the American Jobs Plan that could allow the US government to be a first mover in small modular and micro reactors. Um, the American Jobs Plan has the potential to procure reactors from advanced reactor to vendors enabled by DOE. So we hope to see some of that in the future of the American Jobs Plan. You know, don't forget that in the 50s and 60s, American workers built a fleet of research reactors and commercial reactors all across the country. Uh, and I really think that while a lot of those reactors have retired, not just uh, commercial reactors, but also research test reactors, those, those devices, um, you know, they represented a really like stalwart fleet that our American workers were able to put together and build rapidly in response to a need. And I think we're looking at a new need today uh, for an energy transition that could be enabled by American workers through the American Jobs Plan. So uh, we hope that these skilled workers, uh, including boilermakers and union electricians will be supported by work towards the American Jobs Plan if it is passed inside DOE and outside uh, focused on advanced reactors. Thank you so much, Dr. Huff. Really appreciate those remarks in the context of what the Biden-Harris administration and Department of Energy are, are doing on uh, advanced nuclear and, and union jobs and the American Jobs Plan. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome our guests and panelists. We'll have a conversation amongst them and then open it up to questions from you in the audience. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen during the discussion to ask questions and we'll put them in the queue. Now today, joining us are Dr. Rita Barronwall, the Vice President for Nuclear and Chief Nuclear Officer at the Electric Power Research Institute and a former head of DOE's Office of Nuclear Energy. Thank you for joining us, Rita. Great, Chris Thanks. Levesque, 
the president and CEO of TerraPower, a leading developer of advanced reactor technology. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Josh. Mark McManus, the general president of the United Association of Union Plumbers and Pipefitters. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And Jay Clay Sell, CEO of another front-running advanced nuclear technology developer, X Energy, and the only one of us to bring a prop today, which we should all <laughs> notice for future Third Way events. Before Thanks, we get Josh. started, it's, thank it's you. great to be with you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Clay. Uh, and thank you for bringing the prop. Um, on, on one solemn note, before we get started, our fifth panelist, President Sean McGarvey of North America's Building Trades Unions, is attending a funeral today and couldn't be with us. And President McGarvey has been a champion for workers in today's nuclear industry. He's working just as hard to create new opportunities for union workers in the nuclear industry's next phase. And we're grateful to have him as a partner on so many of these issues. So let's get started. First, a scene setter question for each of you, uh, beginning with Mark. Um, Mark, can you talk briefly about UA's role in nuclear power and what's the link between a burgeoning advanced nuclear industry and, and union workers? Well, I think um, the United Associations, we're celebrating our 132nd year this year, and um, we are more than proud of our forefathers and uh, our actual fathers and uncles and brothers that have uh, built the fleet. Uh, the good doctor have, has spoken on uh, uh, pretty much all across all of North America, uh, and it is a, a tremendous opportunity for the United Association uh, not only in man hours, but just bringing safe, reliable power uh, to North America. Uh, wonderful jobs, uh, highly skilled jobs, right in the sweet spot of what the United Association does. We look at a lot of tentacles in the United Association from plumbing to sprinkler fitting, pipeline work, uh, different things, but the, the highly skilled uh, technical advantages that we spend at the, the United Association and, and train for, $250 million a year in training, uh, is right in the sweet spot of what we can deliver on time, on budget um, uh, in the nuclear industry. So it is a uh, it is a large, large cog of what we do here at the UA. Thank you, Mark. Um, Chris, TerraPower just announced its plans for the location of your first facility, and can you talk about that and the role that unions may play? Yeah, sure, Josh. Uh, so we're super excited um, to uh, announce that we plan to build the first natrium reactor, our, our ARDP demonstration reactor, at a coal plant site that is already scheduled for retirement in, in Wyoming. And it turns out there's four potential sites um, that we're, we're looking at and that we'll announce before the year is over. So um, just a couple of weeks ago, we made this announcement with uh, Governor Gordon of Wyoming, uh, Secretary Granholm participated in the announcement as well, as well as uh, uh, ranking member, uh, Senator Barrasso. So great, great bipartisan support. Um, so, you know, we're excited about so many things with, with ARDP, you know, the chance for America to renew its leadership in nuclear energy. You know, Dr. Hoff was just talking about uh, in the 50s, how we, built these you know, first light water reactors. Uh, we're, we're kind of repeating the history of shipping port right now with, with X Energy's demo and our demo. We're, we're showing the world that this new technology is ready at commercial scale. Um, it turns out that of the four coal plant candidate sites we're considering, all of them have union operators. And so the intention would be, uh, you know, we'll, we'll select the demo site, but undoubtedly there will be other natrium reactors and we would expect these, these plants to have union operators uh, like the, the coal plants have today. Uh, of course, we'll be taking advantage of the grid connections and, and uh, cooling water connections. And then we fully expect the construction projects to be um, you know, staffed by skilled union labor, um, you know, like those from, from the building trades and, and others. Um, so it's a great story for you know, renewed energy leadership for the US and, and nuclear. But it's also a great story for the, the energy transition. I, I think a lot of times we talk about the energy transition. Pe people, especially workers, can't always identify with what are those new jobs. In, in this case, 
we can show them, hey, there will be projects and they will need welders, they will need pipe fitters. And, and these projects are beginning now. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Clay, uh, Chris mentioned the, the X Energy project as well, and, and you've announced you're locating uh, where your location is for your first reactor. Uh, and it's at a facility also with the unionized workforce. Can you talk a bit about your plan and the importance of the workforce that, that you are using or will likely use? So uh, Josh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, to be here. We did announce uh, the Tri Energy Partnership about two months ago. Uh, we're at our location in Richland, Washington, in the Tri Cities region of Washington, uh, with the utility operator Energy Northwest providing the site and providing the operations, and very likely one of their member utilities, Grant County Public Utility District, being the owner and off taker. And it's on that site with those partners that we will build the XC100 plant. Four modules uh, represented by this. Uh, this is a model of one nuclear island module of the XC100 plant. I, I have to admit, uh, this was done by one of Mark's, uh, two of Mark's members at Local 598, UA Local 598 in Pasco, Washington, AJ Fouts and Tanner Strimcha. And uh, they did this fabulous piece of work that we were, we very proudly have on display in our, our headquarters. But it is indicative of the level of excitement and quite frankly, of the, the level of need that will be required for the nuclear uh, uh, build out to occur. Uh, they, uh, Local, 598, Local 598 has a tremendous training facility where they train many, many apprentices and journeymen to upgrade their skills and it's those very skills that we will need in a massive, at a massive scale in order to do what Chris wants to do and to do what I want to do, not just in Richland, Washington, not just in union states, but in open shop states as well, because it's the quality of the individuals, the quality of the skills that are provided that are absolutely so necessary to the nuclear build out. So when I step back and look at what I hear from the current administration, I hear President Biden talk about climate change. I hear him talk about American jobs. And I hear him talk about the national security imperative of US leadership. I maintain that there is no technology, there is no industry that addresses those three objectives of the president more beautifully, more perfectly, more completely than a build out of advanced reactors in the United States. It's why I'm so pleased to appear here with Mark uh, and, and my union colleagues uh, on this call today. Thank you so much, Clay. And Rita, we heard from, from both Clay and, and Mark and, and Chris uh, in part about the potential scale and promise of advanced nuclear. And, and we wouldn't be here today without your leadership when you're at DOE and your continued leadership now at EPRI. We're talking about two projects right now, but where and how big can advance nuclear scale? Can you provide some context for us? Absolutely. So thanks certainly for having me. I very much appreciate being back with you. And um, kudos to Third Way for blazing the trail for advanced uh, reactors. So uh, I definitely want to thank you. Um, so at, just a little bit about EPRI. We're a technology inclusive nonprofit research and development institute, and we serve often as an interface or a bridge between technology developers and end users. And so this collaborative consortium approach versus a company by company approach is really uh, our way of doing things differently. And so one of those ways is our advanced reactor initiative, which is a low cost entry point to EPRI's collaborative model for the advanced reactor community. And when we talk about um, all of the American jobs that can be created here, uh, it includes a stakeholder community of advanced reactor developers, of vendors, of A&E firms, of builders, of welders, of electricians, um, and of electric utilities and other end users. 
as well as the national laboratories, regulators, and government agencies. So in the short term, there's an opportunity to focus on bringing the advanced reactor technologies to market more quickly and cost effectively. And one example that I like to talk about is um, EPRI is working with, with partners uh, in uh, New Scale, Synertech, and Nuclear AMRC to develop a two-thirds scale reactor. And while I would have loved to bring that as a prop for you, um, I think the prop that Clay has brought is, is just perfect and will save my two-thirds uh, react scale reactor for another time when I can be on site. Um, so that's one example. Another, in terms of long-term opportunities, are to look at using nuclear to deploy non-electricity products. So we've heard a lot of buzz around hydrogen, and nuclear absolutely can be used to generate uh, hi hydrogen. There's a huge market that's going to be out there. It's projected to, to increase um, almost tenfold from what it is today. And there's also other applications like energy storage, water desalination, hydrogen production, as I've mentioned, um, and industrial applications, manufacturing applications, chemical processes, as well as isotope production. So there's, there's short-term um, gains as, as well as some long-term opportunities for not only job creation, but job creation in the advanced reactor sector. Thank you. That's, that's, both, that's both helpful context in the jobs that are created, but also really a good reminder for everyone about the breadth of services that nuclear can provide and why you know, we, amongst others, are, are so optimistic that there's going to be a big role for nuclear moving in the future domestically and internationally. Um, you know, as, as a Washington-based think tank, I'm going to get the obligatory sort of Washington and Congress question out of the way. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, particularly this week, and it's been paying attention for a while now about the potential for a bipartisan infrastructure bill, maybe a reconciliation bill as well. Uh, from each of your perspectives, what do you think Congress needs to do to continue to provide the support? that we've seen now across multiple administrations and across both Democratic and Republican control of Congress to support advanced nuclear and make sure it continues to get built out on the trajectory and with the workforce we, we've started to talk about already today. Shall I take it on? Clay, you, you spoke first, so jump in, please. Uh, Chris and I are both, and our colleagues in the advanced reactor community, are beneficiaries of a tremendous consensus that has been developed over the last six to eight years on a bipartisan basis around the importance of nuclear power. Uh, I, quite frankly, the last administration, uh, under uh, leaders, uh, Rita's leadership and others, was outstanding. Uh, I, quite frankly, this administration even promises to be better uh, because of the level of commitment that they have already expressed. And so, you know, what I wish for and what I want to see is that great uh, middle that is so often found the compelling and long lasting solutions in American policy to come together. Uh, if an infrastructure bill is passed, I'm confident that it's going to do a lot. Uh, uh, for the types of jobs that advanced nuclear and other industries will, will create. And, uh, you know, the support is there. The support has been there. The support will continue to be there. We just want to see the Congress come together, pass legislation that the president can sign, and really give a jolt to the uh, economic re recovery going forward. And, and uh, I'll add to Clay's comments, you know, if we're thinking infrastructure for our country, of course, that's roads and bridges, but we have to think about our energy backbone. Um, I'm actually quite concerned that, you know, because electricity has always been there for us, because, um, you know, electricity demand has been fairly flat for the last um, 30 or 40 years, that folks think it will be there for us in the future un unquestionably, and they're not realizing there's some incredible dynamics occurring right now. Uh, you know, first we're expanding wind and solar greatly, which is good, which is very good, but we have to remember wind and solar are intermittent. All right, we're also um, retiring many, many coal plants, um, which are base load power. We're, we're also losing a few nuclear plants, unfortunately, which, which is a, 
um, which, which frankly shouldn't be happening. So you have those two factors um, happening. And now you you're looking at a, probably a doubling of electricity demand over the next 30 years between now and 2050. And, and that's easy to see why it's going to happen. Uh, you know, we've kind of maximized um, you know, LED light uh, gains. But when you hear General Motors announce they're phasing out the internal combustion engine and we're going to have electric cars, electricity demand is going to increase. So I, I think we all realize we haven't been investing in the grid. Uh, we're retiring lots of coal plants. We're going to need a totally you know, renewed source of clean base load power. And, and it's very clear nuclear energy has to be has to be part of that. So I, I really hope policymakers are thinking about uh, nuclear energy and, and frankly, the, the grid as we think about infrastructure. If, if I may jump if, in and follow, follow from please. there, you know, in, in American politics, you know, to get into the weeds a little bit, we're down to very, unfortunately, very, very, very few things that are bipartisan anymore. And I think we're, we're we don't want to say we're at the last one with, with the grid, with energy, with nuclear power. Uh, certainly infrastructure not too, too long ago was, was always bipartisan. And that seems to even have its own divide of what is infrastructure? Are we expanding infrastructure in a lot of different ways? My hope as an American, my hope as you know, leader of the United Association is uh, bipartisanship. Ab absolutely. We'd rather do it that way. M the hearts and minds, more buy-ins. It helps all Americans, all states, all sectors there. And, and to follow up on, on Rita's comments, you know, all the things that it does beyond just the traditional stuff of desalinization of hydrogen, that's right in the selfishly in the United Association's wheelhouse. That is all uh, terrific stuff for us. But um, have, I have some optimism in, in dark uh, polarizing times in DC sometimes on this issue here. Uh, I think it, it carries the day. I think the adults in the room uh, really know this is the way forward for base load power. And, and, and the last thing that I'll add is, is quite frankly, and, and we touched on it as well, I think Chris touched on it, the wind and solar, they're, they're good things as well. Uh, we understand we have to be there, but the subsidies, the subsidies where I think this administration is, is spoken and, and uh, going to be acting more than any other administration is to levelize Level the uh, uh, level the playing field on subsidies as well too. You know, nuclear power is accused of being expensive in some ways. Well, it's extra expensive if wind and solar are subsidized where the nuclear industry isn't. So we get those subsidies back where they need to be, a little bit more of a level playing field, and to get that base load power at all times. Um, we're all the above, but you've seen just in California on the hydroelectric uh, 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 on the uh, on the droughts of the West. You know the nuclear power being the base load. It, it, it should be that the base of America. So, thank you, Mark and Rita. I'm curious both just any broad comments on this, but also um, you were in the previous administration working with both Democrats and Republicans to maintain and expand support for nuclear. I'm curious what your experience and your perspective of how are we at a point where this, what used to be seen as a polarizing issue, where only Republicans supported it, really now is, as, as Mark noted, one of the few bastions of bipartisanship left. Um, I, I, one, I'm thrilled that we continue to see bipartisan support um, that's spanning administration. So that is absolutely wonderful. And we should one enjoy it but then not also not rest on those laurels let's let's continue to prove out the technology and and show what a what a wonderful contribution it is to any uh community's clean energy portfolio um so so i'm, I'm happy about that um i think really it's it's that when you look at just the technology you you, you unwrap and unravel the politics that are around it it is something that indeed can help uh, states and countries achieve their decarbonization targets. So as kind of practically speaking, okay, let's let's go ahead and pursue that technology, nuclear technology, regardless of the very specific uh, coolant technology, if you will. But I do wanna to touch on something that Chris mentioned, and that is um, the importance of maintaining the existing fleet. And what Mark mentioned about subsidies and we're hearing you know, fingers crossed, positive chatter about production tax credits. 
maintaining our existing fleet is absolutely essential to being able to launch advanced reactors, not only for uh, the supply chain base that's out there, but for the knowledge transfer that's going to be needed from the existing uh, you know, employee base to those that are going to start to, to deploy advanced nuclear. So I think when we talk about jobs, maintaining the existing fleet is absolutely vital to the success of deploying, deploying advanced nuclear technology. Rita, thanks so much. That is a really important point. And, and as anyone in the audience and, and all of you know who's followed Third Way, um, we've long been advocates of both making sure that the existing fleet remains open and operating both because of the jobs it creates and also because of its important role as, as the largest source of clean energy in this country. Um, we certainly are hopeful that Congress will, uh, will, will take the lead in, in taking up and passing a nuclear PTC or some sort of action that makes sure that we can keep those plants on a level playing field and they can remain in operation. And, and one question I'm, I'm curious that, that you alluded to on this for everyone as well is, what is, the, um, what is the relationship in terms of a workforce? How important is maintaining the existing fleet? And are there other actions that are necessary so that uh, we have the kind of union workforce that is skilled in building and operating nuclear plants today that advanced nuclear reactor companies are able to rely on as you build out and have more plants that need to be constructed and operated. And so, Rita? Oh, okay, all right, great, thanks. Um, so EPRI um, uh, does have a, a very big hand in this in, in that we are expanding, to, uh, providing our training to the industry and we offer more than 1000 different training classes through EPRI-U. Um, Classes that we offer can be delivered online, uh, they can be delivered on site or at our EPRI sites. And even in, la in, in 2020, last year, uh, we had more than 5,000 classes that were taken through EPRI-U and, and we're on track to exceed that this year. Um, and so it's really important in terms of educating workforce uh, and then also providing training in a consistent fashion so that different utilities don't necessarily have to have on staff training that is consistent across different uh, utilities, different plants. And we're expanding that uh, platform and, and that uh, philosophy to advance nuclear technology as well. And so we're really looking forward to expanding our training portfolio, training class portfolio to advance nuclear technology as those uh, start to, to come to fruition. And I know that um, Clay and, and Chris's technology um, certainly fall, fall into you know, one of the first deployers. So excited about that. One is before we move on, and just a reminder, if, if, first, if anyone else wants to add to that question, please jump in. Uh, I will remind everyone that there is the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are gonna open it up in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, two questions from the audience. So uh, get them in the queue and uh, we will be able to start uh, asking those questions as well shortly. I, I guess since you were talking about human resources, I might just kind of describe what's going on. I think a lot of us know if we look at the last 20 years, we've seen um, a growth in the number of nuclear engineering students, uh, nuclear engineers pursuing PhDs. So you, you in, in kind of the R&D world, you've seen this big growth, right? And, and that's what enabled projects like uh, X Energies and TerraPowers to become ready for demonstration. But now we really need the skilled workforce, the operators, the welders, the pipe fitters, okay? And uh, I know our owner for our demo plant and hopefully owner for multiple uh, natrium plants, Pacificorp, has a great relationship, for example, with their, you know, with their community college, their union memberships. They have training programs that are existing, you know, for their, their current fossil fleet. It's, it's now time to transition those training programs. I think, you know, the skills, uh, operating a coal plant, you know, is very complicated, involves pressure, temperature, flows. Um, those skills are very transferable to, you know, nuclear power operation. And of course, they'll need to be licensed by the, the NRC. But it's, it's really important we take advantage of these retirements. And, and we have a transition with no gaps. Uh, to take advantage of, the, of that skilled workforce. Yeah, and, I, and if I may jump in first, and I was remiss, you know, I, I want to thank Clay and, and, uh, our, and Chris uh, for your faith in, in, in the skilled 
manpower that the unions can provide. We don't take it for granted. We know there, there's, there's options and we know there's alternatives, but we think uh, the value that we display, and, and I wanna thank you publicly on, on the site, but uh, the United Association, we're in the middle of Plant Vogel as we speak, or three quarters or 90% uh, of Plant Vogel. We passed the 70 million man hours, construction man hours through a pandemic. Uh, that this country has not seen in 100 years or, or maybe ever, uh, deemed essential. Uh, if anybody's worked construction, awfully tough to work uh, six feet apart, social distance, and be able to do that in a safe, productive way on building two new nuclear power plants. Uh, 70 million hours translates to over 30 million uh, man hours for the United Association uh, exclusively. Uh, a fantastic uh, story to be told. When we're, when we're done with this. And I, I spoke earlier about the amount of money the UA spends in a year, $250 million per year. In four years, that's a billion dollars of our own money, putting back our own money into our training programs. And what has changed in the last maybe five, 10 years, probably 95% of that money was on apprentice training. Now about 80%, 75% is on that, which is awfully good. But that other 25% is continuing education, continuing education for the new technologies that are coming our way. And we can build a nuclear power plant in rural Georgia on a small local union because we have a bullpen of 50 states and 274 local unions across the country. We can build whatever we need to build in Wyoming uh, in a remote cold spot or hot spot in, down in Texas or uh, in a spot where we may be more uh, settled up in, up in Washington state, but we have the ability to move our people uh, our skilled people, our specific people in this industry to the needs there. So that's the extra value that we bring uh, to the table, a bit of a commercial, but that is all the trades uh, part of it. And how we interact with each one of uh, uh, each one of the trades is just as important. And uh, I'll speak for Sean a little bit here. I've seen him last night before he went off to the funeral. Uh, he is proud of how the operators work with work with the UA, work with the electricians, and that all matters when you're on a real job site as well, too. So, thanks, Mark. Really appreciate that. Um, and uh, we are getting a lot of, of questions. All, all of them are great. And uh, we're going to jump into those because otherwise we're going to run out of time before we can even touch on those. Um, the One of the questions raised, we're talking a lot about the actual construction and operation of the plants, um, but there's also the potential for domestic manufacturing and the jobs that that would create in the United States. Can, can you talk about that and the opportunity for where manufacturing and the supply chain falls into this conversation? And are there any federal backstops that are needed to make sure that it's created in the United States? Well, I'd love to take that one if I, if I could, Josh. Yes, please. And, uh, and so I, I have to compare this to, um, you know, when we were shooting for a nuclear renaissance around 2006, 2007, uh, for those of you who are around nuclear energy at the time, you, you might remember there was a big bottleneck and the bottleneck was Japan Steelworks because we had designs that required super heavy forgings that came from one place in the world. And literally US utilities were lining up for slots in, in Japan. Um, for our, you know, that, that's frankly one of the reasons we think it's time for a new technology. Okay, TerraPower pursued a plant that operates at low pressure. So what does that mean? It means that our reactor vessel for natrium can be welded from stainless steel plate made in the USA. We don't need, you know, the super heavy forge uh, from Japan. Uh, this could be you know, a variety of unions, could be United Steel Workers, many, many different places around the country. A another thing that in this, you know, this new technology enables, frankly, because we've moved to lower pressure, uh, you know, out, folks like EPRI have done so much work with advanced manufacturing. We've heard about 3D printing. I would hazard to say it would be difficult to 3D print a super heavy pressure vessel uh, under high pressure. But if you're moving to a low pressure component, I think it really enables advanced manufacturing. I mean, that's how technology works. You know, you have to, when you move to a new horizon with technology, you know, you enable all these other, other developments, whether in high-speed commuting or, or advanced manufacturing. So um, the, the move to advanced reactors, uh, whether it's because they're lower pressure or smaller, really should enable 
um, US suppliers and, and vendors to be part of it. Many of them do have a speed bump though. You know, they might have a tooling investment that they have to overcome. And, and um, you know, that's where it's really important to have programs like ARDP um, that, that shows you know, these, these vendors that there's going to be a demand. Um, I think it's also great, uh, recently we talked to the loan program office and they're, they're making the point to us that they're willing to offer uh, loan guarantees uh, not just for building a plant like X Energies or TerraPowers, but they're willing to offer loan guarantees to help fabricators make their first of a kind tooling investments. That, that's very helpful. Anyone else on this question or? Well, let's, um, we, we've gotten multiple questions on uh, the time frame for licensing and demonstrating reactors through ARDP, because this is the type of audience third way gets for these events, which is excellent. Um, Chris and Clay in particular, can you, and, and Rita, you, you've seen this from the other side at, at DOE, can, can you provide uh, some information on what the expected time frame of ARD projects is and the, your estimation on uh, what year first advanced reactors will be market ready? Uh, are you putting that to Rita or, or can I answer that? Well, first? you can jump in first. Yep. You you were unmuted first and then we'll just, we'll do Clay, then Rita, and then Chris. So, so our, our licensing schedule, we, we, we contemplate a construction license application for the NRC on our XE 100 plant um, in, in the, the first half of next year. And, uh, and, and, and we assume about uh, you know, uh, 30 months in, in, in total between the construction license application and an overlapped operating license uh, uh, application. You know, that, that's what we assume in our schedule. We, we had to assume that in our schedule because the department wanted these deployed by 2027. And, and we think that's, that's quite possible. We, you know, I, I'm the first to acknowledge that there's risk in that schedule. Uh, anytime you try to do something hard, anytime you try to do something on, a, on an accelerated schedule, it contemplates a risk, but we're doing everything that we can to pre prepare to address that. I believe our colleagues, our, our colleagues, our, our regulators at the NRC are staffing up appropriately to do that. But that's generally the timeline that we need to achieve from a licensing standpoint to have our first unit constructed uh, and, and, and operating by 2027. Thanks, Rita. The, yeah, the ARDP, when, when we envisioned it and, and put the criteria out for the tier one um, awardees was that it be uh, demonstrated in, in five to seven years. And yes, we, we got a lot of feedback that it was very, very aggressive, but we at the time felt that, that, that we needed that aggressive goal to push um, the likes of X Energy and Terra Power and, and clearly uh, they're on path to, 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 to de demonstrate by 2027. And as I always say, there is no penalty for early completion. So we might see it uh, uh, demonstrated before 2027. So, you know, so under Rita's leadership and there were also some great voices, uh, you know, in the Senate Appropriations Office, uh, it, it was really wise for, uh, Congress to write the seven-year requirement in, into law because uh, let let's face it, we've had um, several recent experiences of license of, of licensing processes that took seven or more years. Never mind EPC processes. If we repeat that, um, nuclear energy, frankly, will not advance in the U.S. Nuclear energy will retreat in the U.S. We will cede leadership in nuclear energy technology to China and Russia. We'll lose out on great jobs. Uh, we will have a situation where nuclear energy is, is kind of crowded out of the nuclear energy transition. And I'm, and I'm telling you, whatever replaces it, and I don't know of the right replacement, but whatever replaces it will not be as good for security, as good for jobs, as good for the environment. Um, so. I, I think it was, you know, and, and this is some of the reason for the bipartisan support. People realize we're in extremis. Uh, we need ARDP to work on these seven-year schedules. And that doesn't mean twisting the NRC's arm. Uh, 
you know, the NRC uh, has 3,000 civil servants. Their responsibility is to protect people and the environment. We need to respect that. Uh, you know, under Chairman Hansen's leadership, he's, he's ready to uphold that. Uh, but we do need, and I think our new technologies enable this. You know, for example, with our natrium technology, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the passive air cooling, because of our novel architecture, we should be able to really collapse the NRC, you know, oversight footprint on our site. So it should be a much simpler licensing project. Uh, so we, you know, these new technologies really do enable the compressed schedule. Uh, and we need to do it. If, if we can't do it on the schedule that you know the policymakers set, uh, nuclear energy will will really uh, you know be be facing an existential challenge. I, I really think we will. This is this is really almost our last shot to regain leadership in, in nuclear energy as a as a country. So um, we're going to get back to to some of those questions, and particularly the context of the international competition in a moment. Uh, before we do that, Mark, one question we got was uh, over half the states are so-called right to work or open states, and which are not the most conducive to union projects and work sites. And, and the questioner here asked, you know, uh, do the conditions in those states make it harder to have organized labor involved in nuclear projects? Um, I think a great question. I, I think what it does, is it's a detriment to the, to the state itself. Uh, if you're in a non-right to work state, the chances are the localized workforce, uh, the union density, the skilled uh, journeyman uh, has uh, more of an opportunity to work in their home state, which every chief executive governor should think about those things rather than the headlines of right to work. The, uh, the right to work states uh, Georgia, uh, we can perform just as well, but quite frankly, we're going to use uh, the arms of the UA uh, of the traveler, uh, being able to uh, supplement the local workforce in a lot of different ways. So, if I'm a chief executive, if I want it, in, and and you see this. Uh, with a lot of opposition on all types of projects from a shopping mall all the way to a nuclear power plant. We want the tax rateables going right back to uh, the places where we're building things. That's the argument right there. Uh, and um, it, it, it's a bit more of a challenge, but certainly we have a workforce that's uh, two countries wide and we're working with the administration also to be able to get some waivers in from uh, the st same exact skill set in our Canadian brothers and sisters that, that work on nuclear power plants, uh, Darlington and, and the rest of them up north. Thank, thank you. Chris, one, one thing you mentioned earlier that I, I'm going to ask for everyone is you referred back to the nuclear renaissance. And um, in addition to uh, the challenges of having all of the large containment vessels being manufactured in Japan, we heard even then about concerns about a potential worker shortage, particular in labor and skilled workers as the nuclear workforce ages. Um, that situation has not gotten much better. Um, we are getting more younger nuclear engineers graduating, but there's still a gap. Um, for, for any of you, for Chris, Clay, Mark, or Rita, can you talk a little bit about the recruitment strategies and where are we going to get that workforce from? And are, is there a role for the government in, in helping get more workers into the, the nuclear workforce? Well, from, from our standpoint at X Energy, uh, we're fortunate in that we are building our first project in one of the great nuclear communities uh, in, in the world. Local 598 at Pasco, Washington is a great great UA hall, tremendous training facility. And the reason it's there is because one of the largest nuclear projects in the history of the United States has unfortunately, or fortunately, if you're working on it, been under construction uh, in, at Hanford for over 20 years. And so we're gonna benefit initially uh, from that skilled work, workforce in place in Hanford, Washington, or in, in, the, in that region, but eventually, you know, Chris and I are not, we didn't enter this game to sell one plant or to sell a few plants. We both think that the market opportunity in the United States and the market opportunity globally is one that we're, that's going to sell hundreds of natrium plants, 
hundreds of XE100s plants, not just in the United States, but overseas. And so, you know, it's a fact that the nuclear industry in the United States is in a state of atrophy. And that's, you know, uh, we've built, we've, we've successfully built, uh, provided the plant Vogel plants come online, you know, two and a half units in the last 30 years. And so naturally our workforce is atrophied. That's what's so incredibly exciting. What a tremendous opportunity in front of us to build the kind, the quality of jobs, the quality of careers that our parents had and our parents' parents had when America was being built in the post-Cold War era. I mean, in the post-World War II era, we had that opportunity through decarbonization. Decarbonization is not a negative. Decarbonization is a tremendous opportunity for innovators like X Energy, for innovators like TerraPower to help build a new industry that the United States will first build at home and then we will export all around the globe. And I've already begun talking with Randy Wally, the business manager at Local 598, about how we can build an expeditionary force of plumbers, welders, pipe fitters that will be able to go abroad or go throughout the United States to deploy these units as we build them out. So how the workforce will expand and grow and meet this opportunity, it's really going to be exciting to see how it plays out. But it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for labor, for industry, and for consumers of electricity. Clay, thank you. I have, I have two very last questions I'm going to try to get in in five minutes. Um, so the, the first one is um, for, for Rita, can you talk a little bit about, and, and for, for, frankly for everyone, about the, uh, you know, the, the pace of commercialization of advanced nuclear. How do you see the projects that DOE is currently backing translating into getting more reactors to market? You know, how, how, where is this potential market? So um, the the market uh, one backing backing the projects and with, with this uh, what what our industry would consider a very compressed timeline um, is absolutely essential to getting our our developers products out to market. There are markets not only um, you know in the areas that that Clay and Chris have already talked about, but um, areas like um, Alaska, uh, Puerto Rico, um, and then building out. Uh, retiring coal plants, as, as Chris has mentioned, and, and we've seen um, all the all the big news recently um, from Wyoming. So there's market opportunity there, and then you start to look at what is happening all across the world, and there are populations that just recently have been electrified. So they didn't even have electricity, let alone clean electricity, and they're starting to look at their decarbonization targets. They want to have um, communities that, that are elevated to prosperity, and they are considering new nuclear. And so I think that's a really major market for um, the developers that we're talking about today, along with, with TerraPower and X Energy for sure. And, and so we need to focus on, um, in addition to the, what we're looking at here in the United States, but then the jobs that are created for potentially exporting the technology that's been homegrown um, is, is quite vast. Thank you. Clay, uh, Chris? Well, I was just gonna add the example, you know, shipping port um, proved to the world that light water reactor technology could deliver power at commercial scale. And we're out to do that again with advanced reactors now. When, when shipping port happened, it led to 100 light water reactors in the US and, and over 400 around the world that were really based on that US origin technology. So we're really repeating history here. You know, if we're successful with, with these demonstration projects, which we will be, uh, it will be a signal to capital markets and customers and, and the, you know, the, the capital and the projects will, will flow from there. Uh, Mark, I'm gonna turn to you for last word as we only have another minute and a half or so to uh, wrap up. Any, anything either on commercialization and the potential for uh, your workers or, or more broadly, how you see the future of advanced nuclear fitting in with the UA and the broader union movement? I think I think it fits like a glove and I'll I'll touch back a little bit behind it. Uh, we're all competing. Uh, every industry is competing for the future workforce, the best and the brightest, uh, including the UA uh, and, and the technology 
uh, the folks on this uh, uh, Zoom are bringing, that is an added benefit uh, for the next generation, the younger generation to aspire them, you know, just not, not, uh, no disparage. I'm a plumber by trade. Do you want to come into plumbing craft, but to build the, the, the next generation of the nuclear fleet, I think that turns on a lot of young folks that have a lot of options, uh, for, for, uh, their careers going forward. So that, that fits tightly with everything else within the United Association. So I'll leave it on that note. Well, thank you so much. And I wanted to thank everyone in the audience for joining us and, and sticking with us with this very, very quick paced hour. Um, we have a lot more questions. We'll have to do a part two and hopefully invite everyone in person to do that. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Katie Huff and Dr. Rita Barronwall and Clay Sell and Mark McManus and Chris Levesque for joining us today and everyone for tuning in. If you've missed any part of this discussion or any of our events, please visit the Third Way YouTube page to catch up on them. And we also have advancednuclearenergy.org, which has a lot more information, including touching on everything that uh, we've discussed today. Uh, and uh, we will see you at future events. Thank you all very much.